Hi, I'm Rhett Talbot, and welcome to the Beyond Data podcast. We live in a world of big data where it's sometimes surprising to learn that we don't have, or at least don't have ready access to, the information necessary to really understand a thing, to make important decisions based on something more concrete than anecdote and alternative facts. Beyond Data is a new science podcast tackling issues that are not as data-centric as we might initially think. Issues that require us to go beyond the data. As a freelance journalist and science writer who has covered fisheries at the intersection of science and sustainability for the past decade, I have a pretty well-stocked toolbox full of go-to tools to help me get my bearings whenever I start a new project. Before I dig into the often laborious work of journalism, making calls, arranging travel, submitting FOIA requests, pouring through databases, etc., I reach into my toolbox like any carpenter might and grab the equivalent of my gloves, pencil, and tape measure. There is a reason the IUCN Red List is one of the tools on the top shelf of my toolbox. If you want to check it out, the link is in the show notes at www.beyonddatapodcast.com. The job of the Red List is to use data to assess whether or not a species may go extinct. There are currently more than 75,000 species listed on the IUCN Red List, and each is categorized based on the level of threat it faces. Categories like endangered, vulnerable, near-threatened, or least concern. One of these categories is data deficient, and this is the one which is uh, applied when you've You've got your species information, you've looked at all the different criteria. It's important you look at all the criteria and still you are una- you have insufficient information to determine the extinction risk to the species for any based on any of those other criteria. That's Dr. William Darwall. He's the head of the Freshwater Biodiversity Unit at the IUCN Global Species Program. And while his focus is currently freshwater, he has worked on marine species as well. When it comes to fishes, more than 20% of the species assessed by IUCN, over 3,200 species, are listed as data deficient on the red list. In both the academic and conservation communities, there is some controversy and consternation around IUCN listing so many species as data deficient. As Bland et al. wrote in their essay titled Toward Reassessing Data Deficient Species and published in the journal Conservation Biology earlier this year, quote, Despite the chance that many are at high risk of extinction, data deficient species are typically excluded from global and local conservation priorities, as well as funding schemes. End quote. Or as Parsons et al. put it last year in a piece they published in the journal Frontiers in Marine Science titled Why IUCN Should Replace Data Deficient Conservation Status with a Precautionary Assumed Threatened Status. Quote, Limited agency funds are prioritized towards species that are endangered or vulnerable, and the species that urgently need more scientific attention because there is so little information on them or there are significant gaps in our understanding are sidelined. Hence, designating a species as data deficient may effectively place those species out of sight, out of mind for some policymakers. End quote. The subject of today's episode of the Beyond Data podcast is not a data-deficient species insofar as the IUCN Red List is concerned, but it certainly is, or at least was, out of sight, out of mind for the government agency responsible for its management. While this fish is listed as a species of least concern by IUCN, it officially became a species of greatest conservation need, that's an official designation, by the state of New York in 2005. Today it remains on that list, along with just 17 other marine fish species. Despite its official status as being one of the species of greatest conservation need in the state, efforts by the state to assess the status of its population are virtually non-existent, even though that was one of the objectives put in place by the State Wildlife Conservation Plan in 2005. Why is that? As a public information officer at the Office of Media Relations at the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, I'll just refer to them as DEC from here on, told me in an email, quote, this is a species that is a relatively low priority. The species about which we're talking is the oyster toadfish, also known as a hacklehead or oyster cracker if you're from farther south. 
It's a species that went from a so-called trash fish that was so abundant in the 1980s that fishermen would intentionally kill and dump them to a valuable and unregulated commercial fishery that lasted but a few years before it collapsed. Despite a growing understanding of the critical ecosystem role oyster toadfish play in the estuaries they inhabit, it was a full decade after the fishery is said to have collapsed before New York put any regulations in place. And, as I mentioned already, there is still no concerted effort to monitor the species' recovery in order to assess if those regulations are actually working. The story of New York's oyster toadfish fishery left me with many questions. For example, how do reported commercial landings from a data-deficient, unregulated commercial fishery increase by more than 300% in a year without fisheries managers taking notice and assessing the sustainability of the fishery? How does demand create a valuable fishery almost overnight, and what happens to that demand when the fishery crashes? How can a species that has shown a spectacular vulnerability to fishing pressure be considered by everyone from the IUCN to New York's neighboring states as a species of least concern, not deserving of even a modicum of regulation? And perhaps the biggest question for me, do we learn anything from the story of New York's oyster toadfish fishery? And can what we learned help us avoid a similar situation in the future? To answer these and other questions, we'll need to go well beyond the scant data and hear from those who are actually there. The plural of anecdote is not data, but in the absence of data, the stories of Long Island commercial fishers, known locally as baymen, as well as scientists, conservationists, fisheries managers, and others, will help us get our bearings. The first part of our story reaches back to the 1970s, in the bays of Long Island, where the oyster toadfish is an abundant and underutilized species. Abundant, as in, they're everywhere, and underutilized, as in, who the heck would eat one of those things? As far as my experience with the toadfish, or what we call in our area hackleheads, uh, I've caught many. Richard Federico worked as a Long Island bayman from the late 1970s to the early 1990s. His father is also a bayman, a clam digger to be precise. And while neither Richard nor his dad were directly involved in the oyster toadfish fishery, they both are familiar with the species. Like everyone to whom I spoke who fished Long Island in the 1970s and 80s, Richard recalls just how common oyster toadfish were. From what I remember in the 70s, all through the 70s, oyster fish were incredibly populated in the area. Um, anytime you put a hook down in the water, you'd get an instant bite. And you'd hope it was your target species you were going for. But if we were going for a snapper blues in the local bay area there, you'd catch about six or seven toadfish before you caught one snapper bite. So they were real, uh, a, really a nuisance. When you talk to people like Richard, who were fishing on Long Island before the mid-90s, you hear this term nuisance used again and again in relation to oyster toadfish. Whether recreational or commercial, fishers are generally not fond of the species. But there is one group of commercial baymen whose distaste for oyster toadfish goes far beyond annoyance. When we used to just throw a crab trap in the water, we'd instantly get toadfish in there and they'd constantly take your bait. But uh, even the overnight pots for potting anything, they would get filled with toadfish. Baymen who worked in fisheries relying on traps or pots to catch their target species hated the abundance of oyster toadfish in the bays of Long Island. Most traps or pots are box-like devices where the target species, say a crab or a whelk, gets inside and then can't get out. In the 1970s and 1980s, oyster toadfish, as Richard explained, would commonly fill the pots, which was at best a nuisance. For many baymen, especially ones who engaged in several different fisheries, there was also the knowledge that toadfish would actually prey on valuable target species. My father told me that the, the crab potters, the guys who did it commercially, which would use you know, the overnight crab pots, and they had like, let's say, a bunch of pots, they would, they would save all the uh, toadfish and put them in the big you know, uh, fish, uh, fish barrels or totes and uh, just leave the whole thing out of the water till they died because they were also trying to uh, help with the clam population because those toadfish ate clams, they ate everything pretty much. So they'd leave whole um, cases of them out just to die, and then they'd finally dump them back in or maybe use them as crab bait. Richard was not the only one to tell me stories like this. Ed Warner has spent four decades as a Long Island bayman. You know, I mean, I know for a fact back in the 70s when uh, the toadfish were not a, a sellable product, I know 
Damon would take, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds of them out of pound traps in Reeves's Bay and just throw them on the beach, like, uh, like, you know, just to get rid of them because they were a nuisance. To sum up the situation, in the late 80s in Long Island, the oyster toadfish was the very definition of a trash fish, and that was the most charitable thing to say about them, at least from the perspective of those fishing the bays. As we've heard, Bayman went so far as to actively seek to reduce their abundance, which was entirely legal, as the species was unregulated. I should note here that it is quite common for many marine fishes to be unregulated, even ones that are caught frequently. Back to the 1980s in Long Island. You've got an abundant population of oyster toadfish, and, as one bayman put it to me, they are believed to be, quote, literally eating our dollars, end quote, by preying on important and valuable target species. Add to this that the oyster toadfish is generally considered an ugly fish. How ugly? In 1998, the Marine Biological Laboratory at Woods Hole, admittedly better known for their science and their beauty acumen, called oyster toadfish, quote, some of the ugliest and laziest fish known to inhabit the waters of the Northeast, end quote. Max Miller is chef at the Landings Restaurant in Rockland, Maine. We're going to hear a lot more from Max in part two of today's podcast, But suffice it to say at this point that when I started working on this episode, I knew I needed to eat an oyster toadfish, and Max has been my go-to culinary guy for several years now. Or as Max puts it, In the past, you and I have eaten some weird stuff, Rhett. This is the first oyster toadfish for both of us, and we both agree to disagree with Woods Hole on its aesthetic assessment. It's gorgeous. Um, I don't know how to accurately describe it. Uh, It's like burnt orange with black flake through it. It's really, really cool. Uh, it, like like dying autumn leaves is what the underside of this dude looks like. Check out the pictures in the show notes to judge for yourself. I'll tell you up front that Max and I do appear to be in the minority. Most people, including Carl Labou, who grew up on Long Island and is senior marine scientist at the Nature Conservancy, are more than comfortable with the epitaph, ugliest fish known to inhabit the waters of the Northeast. No one, no one who grew up on Long Island would ever eat one of these things. Um... They, they were never really considered an edible fish. We would catch them all the time uh, and let them go. They're kind of big and ugly and slimy. It's that first part of what Carl said, the part about nobody from Long Island eating an oyster toadfish, that brings us to part two of today's show. Going beyond the data is going to take us to some potentially unexpected places for a science podcast. I've interviewed a lot of scientists and a lot of labs over the past decade for various stories on which I've worked. And while the kitchen at the Landings Restaurant here in Rockland, Maine, is not a laboratory in the traditional sense of the word, it is indeed as much a lab as some of the most prestigious I've had the privilege to visit. Most of that has to do with Max. He's the chef who provided the poetic description of the oyster toadfish earlier in the podcast. While the oyster toadfish's range extends to the Gulf of Maine, oyster toadfish themselves, according to Bigelow and Schroeder's Fishes of the Gulf of Maine, quote, so seldom venture around Cape Cod that none of the fishermen in Massachusetts Bay, of whom Bigelow and Schroeder inquired, had seen or heard of them, end quote. I had exactly the same experience when trying to get a hold of an oyster toadfish myself. My contacts at the Maine Department of Marine Resources, local seafood monger Jess's Market, wholesale buyers who deal in Asian markets in Portland, and of course local fishers, all of them had to Google the species. That meant that I had to resort to both extraordinary and expensive measures to source one. It arrived via FedEx. Okay, so here we are uh, in the truck, and I'm taking a right onto Park Drive in Rockland, Maine, um, in sight of the harbor here. This is where I live and where the Beyond Data podcast is produced. And I'm going to take a left onto Commercial Street and then a quick right into the parking lot of the Landings Restaurant. And um, I'm going to deliver this oyster toadfish that's sitting in the passenger seat of the truck here uh, to my friend and colleague, Max Miller, who is the chef at the Landings. Okay, and here we are at the back door, employees only. Hello! Hey! How's it going? Uh, Good. Conversing with a friend about why my hot sauce has the calm yeast uh, culture. This guy's like the only fermentation god that I know in in real life. Um, Just knows everything. It's crazy. So, let's get him out of the package. You want to? I think so. Okay.
Okay, so there is not any hot sauce involved in the way Max is going to prepare this oyster toadfish. But I wanted you to hear the bit about the calm yeast culture on the top of his hot sauce, because I think it provides a small glimpse into how Max approaches his kitchen and food in general. On this busy morning in the restaurant kitchen, he's in the back going down a rabbit hole with his fermentation guy. Spend some time with Max, and you're going to go down a lot of rabbit holes. And this is anecdote, not data, but the cumulative results in terms of the food Max produces are nothing short of astounding. You're going to get a first-hand taste of one of these rabbit holes in a minute, but first, let's get into this oyster toadfish. To set the scene, we're in the back room of the kitchen near the walk-in. The oyster toadfish is on a cutting board in front of us. It's Saturday morning and the lunch rush will start soon in this kitchen that is very much open for business. For now, though, it's relatively calm. One thing to note before we begin, through the magic of editing, I'm going to compress the time it takes to prepare and cook this oyster toadfish. There is a more complete version in the show notes if you're interested. This is probably pound and a half, uh, 10, 11 inches long, 12 inches long. Oh, if my knife blade, yeah, it's actually it's probably almost 13 inches long. In case I have not made it clear, this is the first oyster toadfish with which Max has worked in a kitchen. So the first order of business is to figure out how to approach butchering it. As far as figuring out butchering this thing, I'm going to treat it a lot like a monkfish. And I think what we're going to have is uh, two very small fillets. For those of you unfamiliar with a monkfish, you can see a picture in the show notes. And you'll see right away, I think, why a monkfish is Max's point of departure for butchering the oyster toadfish in front of us. While the two fishes are similar, it's worth pointing out that they belong to completely separate scientific orders. So with, with a monkfish, you know, like we've been joking, it, with a monkfish, it's a head with a butthole attached to it. <laughs> um, and this seems to be very much the same thing. It's this great large head and a very powerful muscular tail um, on either side. And with a monkfish, you have basically what looks kind of like a lamb saddle with center bones and two fillets. And I think that uh, this is going to be exactly that thing. Um, But I'm interested to find out. As it turns out, butchering this oyster toadfish is indeed quite interesting. For starters, this one is both small and characteristically slimy, making it hard to hold on to. In addition, unlike many other fishes that can be filleted relatively easily right after being decapitated and gutted, this oyster toadfish is, well, quite active many minutes after killing it. Max, however, is not deterred. What I just did was, there's two pectoral fins, fatty pectoral fins, um, that probably help it move along the sand. Um, more accurately or burst when it needs to or not Um, and just like on any other animal where uh, where pectoral fins or arms or a breastplate would meet I split that made an incision along the soft part of the belly um, and everything's right where it should be if he'll let me grab him we're gonna fillet him that is still a lot of activity for from a a severed head. We actually might need to let this rest 10 or 15 minutes. As the oyster toadfish rests, Max and I start talking about markets and pricing. Most obvious, species like oyster toadfish and monkfish, given their anatomy, are unusual in terms of how to value them in the marketplace. I'd venture a large guess that the head probably weighs 10% or so more than the tail. Um, So not uh, super efficient to purchase by weight. Which is one of the reasons that, uh, in America anyway, we don't, you almost never buy um, monkfish unbutchered. As is the norm with Max, the conversation quickly moves in a more thoughtful, even philosophical direction. Producers and consumers don't talk enough about the role marketing plays in food systems. We don't talk enough about the net effect of marketing, which is really about creating demand, on industries like the seafood industry. And ultimately, we don't talk enough about how marketing affects ecosystems, species, and the communities that rely on those ecosystems and species. What we do in America, and speaks to our current situation very accurately, is we have turned our 
whole approach and way of life into a system of marketing and being marketed to. Um, and that speaks very much to uh, how we've decimated salmon, how we have decimated cod, um, how we have, uh, when, when we go out into the ocean and scoop up entire ecosystems of herring, and it's because those fish have a market attached to them. Um, you know, we all think cod is amazing, cod is amazing, cod is amazing, because somebody at one point said, look at this beautiful thing. And it is a beautiful thing, but it doesn't mean that dogfish isn't good. Just because cod's good doesn't mean that other fish can't be good. The culinary trash fish movement is an initiative that has gained momentum in recent years. At trash fish dinners, renowned chefs prepare species that are unfamiliar to diners and more common to fishers as bycatch. Species like sea robin, dogfish, and yes, oyster toadfish. Calling them trash fish has proved effective marketing, especially when these species are plated and served at white tablecloth restaurants for a price equivalent to a fish far more common to diners, and potentially far less sustainable. A species like bluefin tuna or swordfish, perhaps. Some bristle at using the term trash in relation to seafood for which they are trying to create demand. Instead, they use the more descriptive phrase, abundant and underutilized. Regardless of what one calls them, creating markets for these species is seen by some thought leaders in both the seafood and culinary worlds as essential to the survival of working waterfronts and the health of marine ecosystems like the Gulf of Maine. Max, like many of the chefs I know, believes that cooks and restaurants have a vital role to play in shifting perceptions and values in the marketplace. Whether that means considering diversifying one's repertoire into trash fish, or thinking more about the whole animal instead of a single celebrated cut, Max believes cooks and restaurants can and should lead the way. As cooks, anyway, we're the, the sole reason for perpetuating poor market systems um, because we want to give the perception we don't want to the our our market the thing that we market to uh, gives us the necessity to say that you can go out to eat every night of the week and have ribeye over and over and over again there's only two ribeyes and a cow but we market that ribeyes are better, a cod fillet is better, or a halibut fletch is better than haddock, or than cusk, or any number of things, or butterfish, or, I mean, the Gulf of Maine is this unbelievably diverse place, and we seek out, I, I, like, four or five different fish from it, when there's all of this bycatch that we could utilize, and if cooks would get off their fat asses, and learn how to cook with different things, if we would be less lazy and less dictatable by our own market, we could maybe provide an outlet for utilizing bycatch and what shows up within this three days instead of providing the same fucking piece of fried fish in the same exact fucking way over and over and over again. Okay, full disclosure. We did fry one of the toadfish fillets. And it was delicious. But we're going to focus instead on the second preparation, which was, well, just wait until you hear about it. The first step, however, now that the toadfish has had a chance to rest, is to fillet it. All right. So I think that we're going to make an incision at the tail and probably flat cut straight down, uh, straight across the vertebrae. And this is tricky because it's slippery, um, but it's also, and two hours later, there's still a large amount of nerve response. Tricky, perhaps, but Max is up to the challenge and produces two small fillets that he characterizes as halfway between flaky fish and prawn tail with the gray of a raw shrimp. Based on his first look at oyster toadfish fillets, Max is ready to finalize his plan for cooking. Um, so... Two methods of cooking that we're going to try because we only have the two fillets. One's going to be interesting, one's a little less so. Um, maybe that's just me. <laughs> uh, one we're going to beer batter and fry in the traditional way. And the other, we're going to butter poach. 
Um, but we're going to make a pretty intense broth out of an experiment. Now, remember how I promised you a rabbit hole? This is it. The next few minutes will have nothing ostensibly to do with oyster toadfish, but I'm going to guess that an oyster toadfish fillet was never the subject of so much thought or effort before. So here we go. We've got uh, lobster that we have prepared in the style of katsuobushi. Uh, katsuobushi is a uh, basically in the very short version of it is that it's a, a smoked and petrified uh, bonito tuna loin. So what we have done is lightly cooked some lobster uh, and then pulverized it in a food processor with uh, transglutaminase, which is a powder that forms a covalent bond between proteins. And what we end up with is a terrine mold size um, block of lobster that's basically just cooked lobster and then for about a month and a half we cold smoked and then refrigerated this block of lobster every day um, for six to eight hours a day because it was cold smoke and not hot smoke um, uh, so after about a month and a half, we sank it into uh, our boreal rice, um, which I'm interested in playing with different grains another time, but this is a very expensive process. We started with about $140 worth of lobster to fill two terrine molds. And um, then uh, we've lost probably 60% of the water content. I'm not going to try to do that math because, well... I'd be a baker if I could do math. If your interest is piqued, you'll want to check out the pictures of this whole process in the show notes. There is also some additional audio explaining the process in more depth. Oh, and in case you're wondering, Max bakes pretty well too. For our current purposes, you need to know that Max steeps hot water into the shaved lobster bushi to make a lobster broth, or what would be called dashi in Japanese cuisine. While the steeping happens, Max steps outside to harvest some plants, and then we'll take the whole operation to the stovetop. All right, so we're heating up our dashi right now. It's been infused and strained. And we are mounting cold cubes of butter uh, in an attempt to make an emulsion out of the butter that we can cook in. Hopefully it will be stable enough and not break. Uh, as the butter melts into the broth and emulsifies, we'll have a thicker broth, well, more of a sauce consistency than a broth and the plan is that we're going to poach the fish very lightly and slowly in our uh, lobster butter emulsion and then we're going to delicately wilt down some greens from a sea rocket plant in um, butter and fermented ramp uh, and then we're going to garnish with sea rocket flowers powdered sea rocket pods and um, chicory flowers. In goes our little filet at about an ounce, and I'm interested to see how it curls up. In a perfect world, I might have actually trussed this into a circle, to like a concentric circle. Um, but nothing is perfect. Max poaches the filet for several minutes, and he's somewhat surprised but pleased by how it behaves. It's cooked very tightly. Like, um... Muscle structures holding together uh, really firmly. I was expecting this to flake a little bit more. I was actually kind of hoping it was going to do this, but I was expecting um, skate cheek flaking action. I think after probably four minutes at a very, very low temperature, we're pretty much there. I think that's the dish. Can I have two or three $500. forks? $500. Can I have some forks? That is Kate in the background. She's one of the owners of the restaurant, and she's Max's mom. We get into a discussion about what this dish would cost if it went on the menu, but there is ultimately little agreement. What there is agreement on is that the poached toadfish is absolutely delicious, and quite unusual. 
I think that it's um, like just a, a barely cooked shrimp or like if you've ever had raw lobster, which I think is lovely. Um, I think that uh, the dish itself, speaking to what I did to it, is quite good. Um, it's a l maybe strong for the protein itself, um, as far as for its own flavor to sing, but I, I also might be over assessing it. Um, if in a, in a different world with more hours in the day, maybe we would have made a broth from the bones of said fish to intensify its own flavor, to double up a component. Um, maybe we could have cooked it a moment longer, but I, I really do feel that the texture is lovely. Um, it's interesting though, it's different. It's, I haven't quite had anything that texture before. Um, a very tender lobster without the snap in the tail. So there you have it. Oyster toadfish can be delicious, and as Max has shown us, there are options beyond frying that certainly would delight the most discerning diner. Does that mean we should be creating demand for oyster toadfish? Probably not here in Maine where the species is not at all common, but what about from places where it is more common? That question brings us to the third and final part of today's story. That brings us back to the early 1990s in New York, when the oyster toadfish was an abundant and underutilized species, a trash fish. I was fishing uh, for conch in the uh, western end of the bay with conch pods. And uh, my partner, a friend, uh, he was eeling. That's Wayne Grothy. In the early 1990s, Wayne was fishing commercially for whelk, he refers to them as conch, in Long Island's Pecantic Bay. His partner was targeting eels, a trap fishery that dates back to colonial times in Long Island. Uh, and he was selling some eels to some uh, Asian uh, outfits, and they asked him about, hey, do you ever catch oyster toadfish? And he says, uh, no, but, you know, my friend can, you know, because I used to catch a few in the pots, you know, in the conch pots, they'd be laying in there. And he says, you know, we buy them, blah, 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 blah. So, I don't know, We say, I saved up maybe a week's worth. I had maybe three or 400 pounds, right? And they paid us, uh, I believe, $2.50 a pound, which was, you know, you know, 1000 bucks for uh, taking a couple of fish out of each pot and throwing in a tote and then putting it in a, you know, a live car until they came to get them. Uh, you know, it wasn't much work involved in that. Whelks are harvested in whelk or conch pots that resemble little more than a milk carton set on the bottom. As Richard described earlier in the episode, pots and traps seem to attract oyster toadfish. And as Wayne learned, there was a very specific time of the year when his pots would attract the most oyster toadfish. As we fished for them, it became quite apparent that uh, May, June, and July were the three best months. And there was a period of time right around the full moon, two to three days before and two to three days after, that these fish would really, really pot. I mean, it wasn't unusual to go out there and pick up 100 pots and get 1,000 pounds of fish. Given the financial potential, it wasn't long before Wayne dialed in the most effective methods for harvesting oyster toadfish. His observations about when the oyster toadfish were easiest to pot are consistent with what is known about the life history of the species. Carl, the Nature Conservancy marine scientist we heard from earlier, explains. Toadfish will actually um, lay, lay eggs and they kind of sit on a nest the way, um, you know, it's, it's, I guess it's not that common in fish. You can almost think about it like the way birds do. And so they would set these traps and catch toadfish during that time of the year that they were nesting because the toadfish like to make nests in these boxes. Okay. So here's how it works. The male oyster toadfish seeks out a nesting site on an established substrate, such as an oyster reef, eelgrass, rocks, debris, or as we've now heard from both Wayne and Carl, a pot or trap. Once the male has chosen a site, it calls in a female with vocalizations. The female lays her eggs in the nest, and then the male guards them. The propensity of male oyster toadfish using whelk and crab pots as nesting sites set the stage for a devastatingly effective fishery once the demand emerged. It was definitely uh, the best way to make money on, on those three months, or the most money that you could make would be by fishing uh, uh, you know, for the toadfish.
and it required probably the least amount of effort because you didn't, you know, with conks, you have to have bait every, you know, every day. You have to, you know, have horseshoe crabs and dogfish, whatever you're using. And, um, you know, with the toadfish, there's nothing in the pot. You just throw the pot down there. That's it. Go bait, come back, pick it up. Fishing for oyster toadfish is, of course, only the best way to make money if there is a demand in the marketplace. And as Carl, and most of the baymen I interviewed for this story, maintain, nobody from Long Island would eat an oyster toadfish. As Wayne mentioned earlier, the market demand for oyster toadfish primarily came from Asian markets, markets that were already coming to the Long Island baymen for eels. To hear Wayne describe it, the whole business was, well, a little bit sketchy as the fishery first took off in the early 1990s. They pull up in a, you know, a white van that was, you know, all beat, beat up, and uh, they, the whole back of it would be a tank, and they just throw all the live codfish in the tank there. They had an aerator in it, I guess, and uh, you know, off they'd go. But it, you know, it was, it was it was cash. You may be thinking there was probably some illegal activity occurring, and I tend to agree with you. Aspects of the stories Bayman told me both on and off the record sound a lot like the elver fishery here in Maine before the state implemented a swipe card system in 2014. Elvers are young eels that are harvested and sold live to mostly Asian markets that then raise the eels to maturity in aquaculture. Before the swipe card system was implemented, transactions often involve large amounts of cash, sketchy vans and dark parking lots, and plenty of illegal activity. Despite the alleged illegal activity, it certainly was, and still is, possible to buy and sell both elvers and toadfish legally, as Wayne did. I bring up the illegal activity question, however, because it reminds us that the official landings data are likely less than the actual landings. And that brings us to the question of data. I posited at the beginning of the episode that the oyster toadfish fishery in the early to mid-1990s was a data-deficient fishery. I also stated that landings had increased in a short time by more than 300%. You may be wondering how I can call the fishery data-deficient in one breath and then use data to point to a serious problem in the fishery in the next. Allow me to explain. Like the IUCN Red List, there are two other go-to tools to which I turn for data when reporting on a Western Atlantic fishery. They are the National Marine Fisheries Service landings data and the landings data accessible through the Atlantic Coastal Cooperative Statistics Program, or ACCSP. One thing I particularly like about the ACCSP data is that they are the product of a collaborative effort, including regional partners like the Atlantic States Marine Fishery Commission, state partners like the New York DEC, and federal partners like NOAA Fisheries and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I also like that you can search online by species, year range, and geographical area and get near-immediate results. When I started researching this oyster toadfish story, I went to the ACCSP website and asked for all oyster toadfish landings data for New York State between 1980 and 2016. Unfortunately, I got nothing, nothing in return, except a message that stated, quote, warning, species with confidential data to be removed because, quote, the confidentiality rule of three prevents showing certain data for the given parameters. To prevent misleading display of incomplete data, all rows for these species will be removed, end quote. Since I had only requested one species, I got nothing. Julie Simpson, who is the data team leader at ACCSP, explains. In order to protect confidentiality um, for the folks that are involved in this industry, you have to have three fishermen, three dealers, and three vessels um, that are represented in any statistic that is shared publicly. So any data that has less than that three in all three of those categories is considered confidential and not shared with the public. Okay, I get it. I really do. Restricting access to phishing data is intended to protect confidential business information, and that is generally strongly supported by those in the phishing industry. Others, however, express concern that limiting access to data erodes trust in fisheries management agencies charged with managing a public resource. 
Non-government scientists argue that aggregated fisheries data, that's the kind of data released in an effort to protect confidential business information of individuals, are not nearly as useful and can significantly hamper essential third-party engagement in fisheries management issues. Speaking from firsthand experience as a journalist who reports on fisheries at the intersection of science and sustainability, the issue of confidentiality is particularly frustrating when the individual whose business information is being protected is later found guilty of illegal activity. We'll talk about this more in upcoming episodes of Beyond Data. With no data available from ACCSP, I turn to the National Marine Fisheries Service Commercial Landings Data. Unfortunately, there is no landings data for oyster toadfish in the New York fishery prior to 1992, when a reported 5.9 metric tons of oyster toadfish were landed for a value of around $39,000. That's roughly $3 a pound as a reported price. The following year, in 1993, the reported landings jumped from 5.9 metric tons to 15.9 metric tons, and the reported value was nearly $100,000, or just under $2.80 per pound. By 1994, the fishery hit an all-time high, reporting 19.3 metric tons landed that sold for around $2.50 per pound. There are no non-confidential data available for 1995, but by 1996, less than one metric ton was landed. Subsequent years show a virtually non-existent fishery, 169 pounds, 286 pounds, 152 pounds, 52 pounds. In fact, from 2002 to 2010, there are no reported landings of larger than 100 pounds per year. What happened? Did the demand disappear? Or was the fishery fished into collapse? Carl from the Nature Conservancy sums it up. So this was really like an unexploited fishery because no one really ate them. This market developed. And in about two or three years, that, that they kind of burned through this resource. It's a pretty slow-growing glow, slow fish, and they kind of burned out that resource. People made some money at the time that they were doing it. And then it kind of disappeared. Carl was a fishery manager for the New York DEC, starting just after the collapse of the oyster toadfish fishery in the mid-1990s, until late 2002, when he took a job with the Nature Conservancy. His work with the Nature Conservancy was initially focused on leading an effort to develop a management plan for a 13,423-acre piece of underwater property in the center of Long Island's Great South Bay. Simultaneously, the Nature Conservancy was also working with the East End Baymen on shellfish recovery in Pecantic Bay. A central issue at both locations had to do with the recovery, or lack thereof, of shellfish populations, especially insofar as predation was concerned. Uh, predation on juveniles, whether it was bay scallops or hard clams, bay scallops in Pecantic Bay or hard scams in Great South Bay, predation by small crabs was a real problem for the, um, for the folks who are working on recovery. In short, an overly abundant crab population was eating the juvenile shellfish, and at least in part, that was hampering shellfish recovery efforts. So where did this boom in the crab population originate? Carl quickly learned a possible answer from talking to baymen who had fished for oyster toadfish. One of the things that the people who participated in this fishery would remark about is they would throw... Um, if you know what a fish tote is, these are about um, uh, they're, they're, uh, fiberglass boxes that commercial fishermen put fish in. They hold about 70 pounds of fish. Um, they're kind of a rectangular box. And they would throw all the toadfish in these boxes. And at the end of the day, when they would pull them out, they'd be just full of crab shells that weren't in there when they started. And it, it turns out, you know, toadfish just love to eat these small crabs. And... They eat many, many of them. From those regurgitated crab shells, it didn't take much to connect the dots and ask the question of whether or not the short-lived oyster toadfish fishery had reduced the population of oyster toadfish to such an extent that it precipitated an explosion in the crab population. That hypothesis, that oyster toadfish play a critical role in maintaining shellfish beds, is supported by the science. And, as Dr. David Kimbrough of Northeastern University explains, it goes well beyond oyster toadfish eating the crabs. Toadfish are maintaining oyster reefs through fear, more so than they are by eating the little crabs. Did you get that? In addition to eating crabs, 
oyster toadfish put the proverbial fear of God into them. They do this not only by swimming around, but also, as Kimbrough's research shows, through their vocalizations. So these are smaller crabs, typically mud crabs is their common name, and they feed on sort of the smaller juvenile stage bivalves, both oysters and clams. So when it comes to bivalve habitat, be it an oyster reef or a scallop or clam bed, oyster toadfish are actually not a nuisance? They're actually really important? Based on our simplified food web, yeah, toadfish are are definitely very important. So if you take them away, you're going to have negative indirect effects. And that's exactly the conclusion the Bayman reached based on the multi-stakeholder work they had undertaken with Carl and others. They realized... In, in 2003, after having all these discussions, meeting with all these scientists, that predation on the hard clams and the base scallops by these same small crabs was a real problem for their recovery. And they made the determination that they would rather have the long-term stability of re- revitalizing these shell fisheries than this kind of short-term fishery that kind of already came and went that they had with the toad fishery. And they actually recommended at a meeting where we had the the top um, fishery management uh, person from DEC in a room full of uh, fishermen, they made several recommendations, and one of them was to just shut down this toad fishery. The issue was taken up in a September 2004 meeting of the New York Marine Resources Advisory Council a group established in 1987 by the legislature to provide advice to DEC. Gordon Colvin of DEC reported to the council that he had been in touch with staff at the Nature Conservancy, who had been in touch with Bayman about, quote, the status of the population of those fishes that prey on predators of juvenile shellfish, in particular oyster toadfish, end quote. Specifically, the council expressed interest in at least exploring the possibility of instituting management measures that would help the oyster toadfish population recover, quote, as a way to assist in the restoration of inshore shellfish populations on Long Island. In November of the same year, Wayne Grothy, who is now working for the Nature Conservancy, spoke to the council, explaining the issue and summing up the sentiment of the baymen. Quote, the Bayman would like to see active management of toadfish catches to aid the clam restoration efforts. They would recommend either a low possession limit on toadfish or perhaps a complete moratorium on fishing for and retaining this species. End quote. All this was out there, and it took a long time to get DEC to finally take action. They did not um, decide to follow the recommendations uh, literally and just close the fishery down, but they did end up eventually um, closing the season. That was that uh, nesting season where they're really easy to catch, where they were just kind of going and lay eggs in the nest. And in essence, you were not only removing the toadfish, but you were removing the eggs at the same time when that happened. In 2006, more than a decade after the fishery collapse described anecdotally by Wayne, Carl, and other baymen, and seemingly confirmed by the available National Marine Fishery Service data, the new regulations for toadfish went into effect. The regulations adopted for the commercial fishery established a closed season from 15 May to 15 July when the oyster toadfish were spawning. Further, a 10-inch size limit was put in place, as well as a 25-fish trip limit. On the recreational side, a closed season and a 10-inch size limit were also instituted, along with a three-fish bag limit. Around the same time, and as a direct result of the multi-stakeholder work Carl and Wayne were part of with the Nature Conservancy, the oyster toadfish was added to the state's list of species of greatest conservation need. What effect did the new regulations in the listing have? To try to answer this question, I spoke with John Maniscalco, who is the Bureau Chief, Marine Fisheries at DEC. I would say there's a great deal of uncertainty whether the regulations are working. Um, Given limited resources, uh, oyster toadfish isn't something we've concentrated on, and I haven't actually looked at surveying the seas on oyster toadfish myself, so I'm interested to see if there has been any indication of a you know, rebound in population or at least maybe an increase in, you know, the size and age structure um, of fish. In addition to the other material I requested from DEC, some of which they gave me and some of which they refused to release for reasons already explained, I did receive the Peconic Bay trawl survey data from 1987 to 2017. 
These data are not the best to assess oyster toadfish population abundance, but they appear to be the best we have. You can check out a graph of the data in the show notes, but essentially it shows a dramatic spike in 1991 and then a precipitous decline to well below the late 80s data. Things appear to improve a bit after the regulations go into effect in 2006, but they do not return to the levels of the 1980s until 2011 through 2013. It's important to keep in mind here that the earliest year of survey data released to me by DEC is 1987. And we know from what Bayman have already told us that by then, there had already been more than a decade of effort to reduce the population of oyster toadfish. It is therefore reasonable to assume that the 1987 data represent an already depleted oyster toadfish population. Unfortunately, we don't have the data to confirm that. This is a good example of the problem with so-called shifting baselines. If fisheries managers set out with the goal of returning the population abundance of oyster toadfish to baseline levels indicated by the earliest available data, they would potentially be setting their recovery goal on an already severely depleted population. To get a sense of the real baseline, we'd have to go beyond the data. We'd have to go back to the anecdote, such as the stories of Bayman observing such abundance that the species was considered such a nuisance that it justified throwing hundreds of pounds of oyster toads onto the beach to die. But back to the survey data. After 2013, the bottom again drops out, with 2017 being amongst the lowest levels of oyster toadfish abundance reported. If the regulations are working, shouldn't we see something different in the survey data? Shouldn't we see a dramatic upturn in population abundance, especially once the young fish that are now being protected have had a chance to spawn? Or is it possible that the fishing pressure, both the active removal of fishes as a nuisance species in the 1970s and 80s, and the short-lived commercial fishery boom in the early to mid-1990s, reduce the population to such an extent that recovery through regulations alone is not enough? After all, the species is believed to be fairly sedentary, and it lays eggs in a nest as opposed to pelagic or open-water spawning that allows young to be distributed over a wider area. In other words, if you fish out an area, a place like Peconic Bay, it may take a very long time before the remaining resident adult oyster toadfish can repopulate that area, even with regulations in place. Further, as Jake Kreitzer of the Environmental Defense Fund pointed out to me, While toadfish are protected during the spawning season, toadfish eggs laid in pots and traps targeting other species like whelk may well be lost during legal fishing for those other species. To really promote recovery, would seasonal bans need to be instituted across all trap and pot fisheries? Looking back on the research I've done, it strikes me that there are two main issues on which we might focus as we bring this episode to a close. The first is a question of why DEC still doesn't have the data to answer many of the questions we've asked about the species, the fishery, and its recovery. The bigger question for me, however, is that if overfishing is responsible for what both the data and the anecdote suggest is a severely depleted oyster toadfish population in New York, then what can we learn from what happened, and can we prevent it from happening again to other species in other places? On the first point, remember that DEC spokesperson who told me the oyster toadfish is a, quote, relatively low priority, end quote? She also told me in an email that, quote, the minimum size limit for oyster toadfish in place in New York State is large enough to allow fish to mature and reproduce prior to legal harvest, end quote, and, quote, there is no mandate that would direct further resources to its management, end quote. That seems odd to me, given the 2005 stated objective of assessing the oyster toadfish population, which is written into the DEC's State Wildlife Comprehensive Plan. After all, this plan is, according to DEC, the state's guiding document for managing and conserving species and habitats before they become too rare or costly to restore. And the plan clearly states that, quote, failure to take action to understand, manage, and restore toadfish populations may result in the loss of an important component of the ecology of New York's estuaries, end quote. That seems a fairly compelling mandate for additional study and management of the species, given that the existing data show that the regulations don't appear to be working. Of course, this is all easy for me to say, sitting here behind the microphone, spending an hour with you talking exclusively about the oyster toadfish. 
But as John has already indicated, DEC doesn't have that luxury. Here's my exchange with John on that point. And while oyster toadfish, we can talk about them being incredibly important and the ecosystem role they play, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are, there are, uh, they, they are an issue, but, but likely not your biggest issue. That's accurate. <laughs> <laughs> John is also not convinced by the data he's seen that overfishing was the only cause or even the biggest cause for the decline in oyster toadfish abundance. Usually the cause for a species decline is, is complicated, um, especially when all of a sudden you adopt, you adopt the regulations and you don't see the dramatic um, recovery that you would expect if you were allowing all fish to reach maturity and to spawn several times prior to harvest. I mean, you know, in most respects, that should be enough unless there's some other mortality causing events, some, you know, whether it's related to development, habitat, uh, environmental quality, you know, pesticide contaminants, you know, choose your, choose your story. Um, I just, I, it's almost always more complicated than just overfishing. John even proposes an alternative theory, suggesting that maybe the landings data mirror the abundance. Abundance peaked in 91 and then declined. So it's even possible that you are you were seeing intensive fishing on, you know, a single year class or one or two incredible year classes that moved through the fishery and then were, you know, very quickly removed. Um, it's, it's very hard to really say, um, you know, we're oyster toadfish that abundant prior? Well, you know, was it a fact that we weren't collecting data, so there was uh, incredibly large fisheries in the 80s uh, that just crashed in the 90s? I, I can't answer that. While we may not be able to answer that question based on the available data alone, and while it's clear the other stressors, things like brown tide and coastal development, have affected oyster toadfish populations in Long Island, I think we've presented enough other evidence here to point to the oyster toadfish fishery as a leading cause of what the data appear to show as a severely depleted population of oyster toadfish. And that brings us to our final question. Have we learned anything that will prevent a similar situation? This is a particularly important and timely question for a couple of reasons. First, species are moving, often as a result of climate change and warming ocean temperatures. Growing up in Connecticut, for example, lobster was abundant in Long Island Sound. That fishery is virtually gone today, but the lobster fishery in the Gulf of Maine thrives. Arctic shrimp, which used to support a relatively small but important fishery in Maine, have become so scarce in Maine waters that fisheries managers close the fishery here while my friends in Canada and Scandinavia continue to enjoy a robust shrimp fishery. Black bass, blue crabs, The list goes on and on with species that are on the move. And often that means moving beyond state or national boundaries into regions where species-specific regulations may not exist. Add to this dynamic a growing middle class in China and increased demand for various fisheries products from the U.S., for which there are no real domestic markets and therefore no fishing regulations in place sufficient to manage sudden demand. I'm thinking especially of the stories of both the urchin and eel fisheries here in Maine. Finally, as we fish down the food chain, we are targeting species we didn't used to target, sometimes out of necessity and sometimes because we're being told it's the right thing to do. Think culinary trash fish movement, where the species that are abundant and underutilized, and sometimes unregulated, are promoted as the best choice for environmentally conscious seafood consumers. Any one of these fisheries could be the next oyster toadfish fishery, a data-deficient fishery where demand suddenly emerges and outpaces management. Are we better equipped in 2017 than we were in the early 1990s to respond and stave off a fishery collapse, one that could have wide-ranging ecosystem effects? I asked John what he thought. If there was some kind of fishery, some species that suddenly came on the radar, um, people were willing to pay for it, uh, and it was available in large amounts, or some um, some other fishery was essentially displaced through regulation or you know collapse or, or closures of some sort, Assuming that they're still fishing under some other federal permit, they would be required to report what they're landing. Now, I don't think there's any hardwired system that would catch this, so it would have to probably come as a result of someone else concerned or, you know, some kind of um, sampling that...
Basically, the gist is, and I've heard this from other state and federal fisheries managers, that today we have more data, and maybe even better data, but there is, to use John's words, no hardwired system that would catch in real time a spike in landings for a species that is unregulated or poorly regulated, an otherwise off-the-radar species. John goes on to explain, however, that there are other checks at both the state and federal level, including market sampling and observers on board fishing vessels who monitor both catch and bycatch. Is that enough? I think it's less likely that the fishery could grow explosively without notice, but I'm not going to say that it couldn't happen. Hopefully, the data and the systems will catch up with the challenges posed by fisheries like the oyster toadfish fishery. Until that time, however, it's incumbent on all of us as seafood consumers, chefs, fisheries managers, and fishers to go beyond the data. We need to use our own observations and listen to the stories of others. We need to ask the difficult questions and continue the dialogue into restaurants and farmers markets, the offices of NGOs and state and federal agencies, the deck of the fishing boat. We need to not expect binary answers, black and white, yes and no. Seafood, like many things in life, is complex, and reducing those complexities to a stoplight approach may be the best tool at our disposal at the seafood counter, but it's been shown time and again to be insufficient for moving an industry fraught with sustainability issues in an ever more sustainable direction. I certainly don't have all the answers, but I firmly believe that if we're having the discussion, we're making progress. Thanks for listening. In addition to my guests, special thanks to Jake Kreitzer and Avery Federico for assistance with today's show. Music by Andy Cohen and a big shout out to Clay Groves of the Fish Nerds podcast for his indispensable help launching Beyond Data. If you'd like to ask a question or make a comment about today's show, email me at ret, that's R-E-T, at rettalbot.com. Leave a voicemail at 207-370-1575. Send a tweet to at rettalbot or comment on the show's Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash beyonddatapodcast, all one word. We'll follow up on your comments and questions in next Friday's Follow Up Friday podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider subscribing on iTunes, where you can also rate the podcast and post a review. That really does make a difference.